organization uh, uh, of our of our community, as well as thousands of unique visitors yearly from over 80 countries around the world. And I'm going to put some timeline things in here as well. So these are kind of some milestones. So as I said, in June of 2006, TechSoup began exploring Second Life and began having regular meetings uh, that Susan uh, uh, Glitteractica Cookie was organizing. And then in 2007, uh, we uh, first launched the uh, Simulator Region and Open Set, uh, our, our region in Second Life, and began the nonprofit Commons in Second Life uh, community. And then by August of that year, we uh, had, uh, oops, I think I kind of repeated that by, uh, sorry, um, by April of the next year. Uh, along with Philip Rosedale, uh, Glitteractica Cookie, Susan, um, was on, on a, a congressional panel that testified about the uses of Second Life and uh, as part of the Telecommunications and Internet Subcommittee congressional hearing. Um, so we've also been an integral part about uh, speaking about how uh, virtual spaces like this can be important in the uh, greater um, public sector. And uh, in 2010, Nonprofit Commons and Second Life was a Linden Prize finalist. I think actually, and I don't know if Gentle, I think Gentle's in the audience, I think that year Gentle um, uh, Virtual Ability were the winners, but we were finalists with them. And by um, 2000, and, well, but today, we uh, still continue to host our weekly meetings every Fridays at 8.30 a.m. to 10 a.m., so we're just a little bit earlier than we normally would be. Uh, and then uh, for nonprofits, libraries, uh, educators, and those interested in social good and uh, related technologies, um, and we also host, and I know once we get to that, Zinnia and Buffy will get into those more, but we also host um, uh, kind of mentor and peer-to-peer uh, -peer kind of mentoring that happens within the community. We also host networking and social events, other kind of cause building things. And um, that link is to uh, a great kind of infographic that shows the timeline of what I was just talking about. So uh, the first thing I'd like to do is introduce everybody that's with me here. Um, and I'll, I'll start off with myself and then I'll kind of go on to everybody else. So um, I have been uh, within Second Life uh, since January of 2005. My background formally is as a designer um, <clears throat> and I've been working with within the business sector and then within uh, in, as, in the educational technology and the nonprofit technology uh, space um, uh, since 2007. Um, and uh, so over a decade in Second Life, and I've been using this platform for community development of educational nonprofit technology, creative um, uses, um, and, and also other kind of community virtual uh, community uses with the with the user base at large. Um, so I've helped organize the Second Life community conference. Uh, if you ever went to those, um, that happened in real life, and um, I uh, also am uh, I run uh, the nonprofit avacon.org uh, which uh, has also organized the yearly uh, open simulator community conferences which you know that's open simulators an open source version of uh, second life and um, uh, they through my um, knowledge as an educational technologist and uh, nonprofit technologist um, I pr previously worked with global kids which some of you might be familiar with them as um, the, they were involved within Teen Second Life when that existed here as the first nonprofit org working in that space. Um, and as I said, I currently manage non, uh, cur currently manage nonprofit Commons in Second Life, along with um, uh, founding Avacon.org. Put that part in here. So um, let's get on to our panel. And what I'll do is I'm going to start for my think the side of, I'll start for where Cheyenne is since um, Brenna is kind of rising back in. So, um, <clears throat> and again, these are all folks that are part of our nonprofit comments community. They're all mentors. They're all, um, uh, or have orgs and offices within our space. So uh, Cheyenne is Monique Richer, 
um, in, uh, in the real world. And she is a French-born writer, a producer, and a nonprofit manager. Um, she has written books uh, as well as producing, directing, and writing for visual media on health, fitness, and well-being. Um, her various books, CDs, and books compromise her impressive catalog that has been um, uh, that is an uh, impressive catalog that's been distributed by Warner Brothers France, BMG, Dial, and international publishers. She has 30 years' experience managing companies um, and those who listen in chat, and 25 years of directing video productions. And since her arrival in the U.S. in 1999, she has directed uh, video productions such as uh, music video productions such as Protect Yourself and See to, See to Live. Um, she is the uh, uh, one of the founders directors of, of uh, Protect Yourself One, and um, uh, she is uh, managing new um, new media media projects there, and. Um, the and uh, the founder of Also Safe to Live, the virtual edu health education program, and a public speaker. Um, I will go on to Buffy, and let me put her there, bio in there. So Buffy Bye, which I think all of those of us on the panel is probably one of our she probably, I think, outdates all of us as uh, helping with nonprofit commons. Um, uh, she is, uh, Buffy Bai is Buffy Beale, um, an avid supporter of nonprofits in Second Life, um, in, uh, uh, as a member of the management and mentor teams of nonprofit commons since 2007, and believes that virtual worlds will connect us in the future in ways we can only imagine now. Um, she manages the Bridges for Women virtual office in Nonprofit Commons and as a longtime volunteer in uh, real life for the Gutsy Nonprofit and she uh, has also been on the board of directors there as their technology advisor. She is the training director of an ace flyer of the Zero G Sky Dancers if anybody has uh, got a chance to see her at those performances. Um, that those are uh, a Second Life performance art troupe often compared to the Cirque du Soleil. Uh, Buffy retired in early 2009 from a lifelong career in computer technology with the Ontario and British Columbia provincial governments with, pos with positions ranging from user and network support, programming, software instructor, and then to her final position as service integration engineer managing large-scale, high-profile implementations for IT services. Now let's move on to Corin. So Corin, or Dick Dillon, in the, as folks know him, thanks. Thanks, Buffy. So Dick Dillon has held many positions in his 30 plus years of involvement with the behavioral health field, including counselor, clinical team leader, program director, and chief operating officer. He's also been a consumer of services. Soon after graduation from the treatment program, Dick Dillon began working with other people in early recovery, first as a volunteer alumni coordinator, then as an addiction counselor, clinical team leader, and program director. In 2000, Dick joined Preferred Family Healthcare, which was then, as now, one of the most progressive and fast-growing mental health service providers in the United States. He served at PFH for 11 years as Senior Vice President of Planning and Development and in his own words, my job was to help determine what we need to do next to be the best of services to our clients and the resources that make that happen. In November of 2011, oh, we got cut off at the end there. Let me grab that in. In November of 2011, Dick formed his own consulting org, Innovation LLC, devoted to helping behavioral health and other human services organizations become more innovative and effective by combining common sense, vision, evidence-based practice, and cutting-edge technology. A hallmark project has been developing over the past years, Avatar Assisted Therapy. Uh, it recently won third place in the Lockheed Martin Innovate the Future Challenge, I think that was last year, um, in competition with, early, uh, with nearly 500 and other entries in the field of science, research, and performance. Uh, Dick's philosophy is simple, make the seemingly impossible possible by blending unbridled passion for the success of others with concrete research, solid clinical practice, and imaginative problem-solving solutions. And now we will head over to um, Red, talk with Mary. Let me grab hers. Here we go. I think we kind of cut 
off the end of that too. So, um, oops, and I did. I cut off the beginning. Sorry. Oops, that text chat is going to be really weird. Okay. Here's the beginning, and then we'll get to the where the part. Marie Celestin, um, talked with Marie here in, in Second Life. Um, Marie's mission, uh, Marie is a mission-driven professional with over 15 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, with a special focus on women's organization and community media. She studied uh, gender cultural studies, family studies, and critical creative thinking in graduate school. She's currently a doctoral candidate in the Education Leadership and Change Program at Fielding. In addition to her education, she's a champion of women, women's and girls' rights. She founded the Girls uh, Growing Individual Reaching to Life Struggles Project to connect collective voices and resources to create social change. The programs are designed to engage, educate, and prepare young women to be effective leaders and media makers. And then let me get to the second part in order now. Marie is the producer and host of Talk with Marie Show. The show provides an outlet to highlight the positive contributions of individuals and organizations working on various social issues. The show is a unique position to reach out to a global audience through the, pro the production of socially conscious interviews. She explores real-world issues while engaging, uh, while engaging uh, activists through, never, uh, through newer technologies such as Second Life, um, and her past guests have included uh, directors of nonprofits, poets, musicians, athletes, activists, bloggers, those who require more than uh, one title and others who simply shun titles. And the other piece. For, uh, for example, recent segments focus on girls' education in Rwanda, women in elected office, mothers fighting against violence, disability rights, and access to higher education for students in Haiti. The show plays, uh, the show places doing good at the center of its stories and highlights how change is happening all around us. Marie's professional, educational, and community endeavors are often meshed with issues she devoted, to her, uh, devoted her life to. At the core of all her roles, gender and public service remain her motivation to make and sustain transformational change. And now let's, now let's introduce Zinnia, who some of you know her as Renee uh, Brock Richmond. this piece so it doesn't cut it off. Renee Brock Richmond uh, is an artist, instructor, and superhero, empowering people to be their best visual, uh, virtual and tangible self by advancing excellence, ex exceptional pursuits, and individualism through creative expression, encouraging instruction with inspired results. Renee has actively taught fine art and digital media for over 20 years and is the Multimedia Communications Program Coordinator at Peninsula College. Her company, Unique as You, specializes in color perception, interaction, and utilization uh, to create motivating, engaging experiences with innovative identity development, marketing, social media events, and immersive environments in businesses, nonprofits, educational institutions, organizations, and communities. And here's the next piece. She has been teaching virtual worlds use since 2008 with the University of Washington Peninsula College, um, uh, Federal Consortium for Virtual Worlds Conference, and the National Defense University Virtual Worlds Best Practices in Educational Conference, TechSoup Global, Nonprofit Commons, Virtual Ability, um, Rockcliffe, uh, the SLCC, uh, Arizona State University, all focused on the evolution of intelligence, expression, and superheroes. And she earned her Bachelor's of Science in Art at Lewis and Clark College and her Master's of Fine Art and Visual Art at Vermont College at Norwich University. And she graduated from the first pioneering class of the University of Washington Certificate in Virtual Worlds program in 2009. Renee only uses her superpowers for good. And let me grab a Bernance. So Brenda Bryan is Brenda Benoit in front of us, and let me paste that here too. Brenda Bryan uh, holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Sociology and Anthropology from North, uh, Northeast Missouri State University with a minor in Criminal Justice. She holds counseling credentials through the Missouri Certification uh, Board uh, as a certified reciprocal alcohol and drug counselor, certified co-occurring disorder professional, and a substance abuse traffic offender program qualified instructor. 
She has been employed with Preferred Family Health Care for over 20 years, working with adolescents and adults with substance abuse and mental health issues. She has held various positions, including community support specialist, counselor, family counselor. She serves in her present capacity as a, a portal virtual services counselor. She has been serving in this capacity since the inception of portal visual services programming at PVH, which uh, occurred in 2008. So that's everybody that's on the panel. Thanks, everybody, for being here, too. Um, so what I'd like to kind of start with um, and throw this sort of question out to everybody, and we can uh, probably do it in order. And feel free to add in any additional other things that you want to um, add. So Nonprofit Commons um, has been an active community of practice. Practice. Oops, within Second Life since, as I said, 2006. Um, how did you each come to be involved with the community? And you know, feel free to share uh, your work as you go in, in that too, and how that relates to the community. And we can start off with, um, if we want, we'll kind of go the other way. We can start off with Brenna, if you want to start there. Thanks, Ryan. I actually became involved in the nonprofit commons um, very early uh, <laughs> on uh, with uh, Dick Dillon, uh, Cohen here, um, as Preferred Family was exploring the possibility of utilizing virtual uh, world uh, platforms to provide counseling services uh, to some of our clientele. Um, Dick, along with a group of others, actually uh, worked on a, a research project to explore uh, the possibility of this, uh, what I'll describe as his brainchild. Um, and so, uh, prior to this, I didn't have any experience in virtual world platforms. And so, uh, luckily for me, I had some, some good supports. Uh, from uh, people, uh, some of which are sitting right here on the, the stage with me, and others that really held my hand for me to be able to experience the immersiveness of the virtual platforms. And as a result of getting more comfortable with the platform itself, I was able to uh, become what we would call the experienced uh, clinical staff at our agency uh, in the virtual setting and I actually became the very first uh, what we call virtual counselor um, and everything for preferred family health care in 2008. Um, we started a project sponsored by the Missouri Foundation for Health. Um, it was a grant-based project providing aftercare outreach services to some of our adolescents coming from residential substance abuse uh, that lived in the most rural areas and didn't have the access or intensity of service that they needed in order to uh, continue working on recovery efforts after they returned home. As a result of uh, providing those services and, and uh, <clears throat> other resources to the clients, we have since been able to seek uh, grants from the federal government, uh, from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, um, and currently are able to provide uh, contract services uh, for several judicial circuits in the state of Missouri that also have grant services and other private agencies. So uh, most of my work uh, currently is conducted on private platforms uh, where we can provide for HIPAA compliance and confidentiality to provide the clients the counseling services that they need uh, to have access to, to for continuing care and stability. Great, thanks Brenna. Um, I'm going to actually kind of jump over to Corin since it dovetails a lot with the, your work together at Preferred Healthcare. So if you want to chat about your coming to Nonprofit com Commons and then um, uh, kind of jump from where Brenna was talking in your work and current work as well. 
Sure. Um, so I, I've been in Second Life for a little bit more than nine years. And uh, honestly, the Nonprofit Commons project is probably the piece of Second Life that I discovered earliest and has, has uh, kept me involved over all that period of time. Um, I was kind of uh, new to the online multiplayer gaming world. I don't really play uh, other games or uh, competitive. You get involved in competitive worlds, but uh, somebody had mentioned the Second Life concept to me, and it sounded interesting of a virtual world that was more or less constructed by uh, the residents. And when I first... uh, first visited uh i found a little announcement of uh, a group that had just formed the nonprofit commons i got in touch with susan and and uh, started attending the meetings um over the first two or three years in particular we did a lot of development of some uh, the sims that we have uh that are that are currently um uh, populated by members of nonprofit commons, and I, I had a, a, a hand in the development of, of uh, those and uh, helped out as sort of the utility office-based developer uh, for, for new members who were coming in and uh, to help them figure out how to, how to set up their offices and publicize their services. So, um, Got involved, got involved early on, as I said, and one of the things that came out of that and, and just spending time inside the virtual world and, and uh, becoming a, uh, immersed in it, I uh, started to think about the utility of uh, this type of a, of a platform as a way to uh, interact with the clients that we had. Uh, as, as Brenda mentioned, we... Um, Preferred family health care uh, spans a pretty big chunk of geography in the Midwest in the United States. And uh, so we have a lot of uh, offices, but we're also in some significantly rural areas. So it's not uncommon for clients to have very long drives uh, to get to our offices. And we saw a lot of client dropout because of transportation issues and it seemed that uh, the possibility of uh, introducing some of these clients to a, a virtual connection with with our counseling staff would be a, a good idea and uh, as she mentioned we got some pilot funding and turned the success of those programs into even more grant funding I think over the the years that I was at Preferred, we probably uh, got two to two and a half million dollars worth of funding from various sources to to use uh, virtual environments as as counseling centers. Um, in 2011, I uh, left Preferred, as <coughs> uh, Joyce mentioned already in my introduction, and I started my own consulting business and and uh, f- over the four or four and a half years or so that I've been doing that I would say about 50 percent of the consulting work that I do is still with organizations who are interested in exploring using um, virtual worlds or uh, multi-user virtual environments to uh, help them do their work better uh, not all of the projects have directly involved counseling, although many of them do. Um, I'm currently involved with a project with a university, actually a, a, a several university systems in, in Missouri that is uh, purely a training project, training uh, medical personnel project. And uh, uh, had a project that is kind of coming to a close with another organization in the St. Louis area to create a a virtual community services area, not sort of a a localized nonprofit commons where uh, multiple agencies who provide services to 
uh, to youth in the St. Louis area are able to uh, have offices and make uh, young people aware of the services that are available to uh, kids between the ages of 12 and 18 uh, without them having to have a driver's license or a car or anything. They can come in into that virtual community center and, and learn about varieties of services, make connections with the people and and uh, do follow up with them. So um, that's my intention is, you know, to continue to uh, explore ways to use this type of a platform uh, in order to solve a lot of the problems that people have with accessibility to uh, whether it's educational or health related or counseling related services. Great. Um, I figure we can jump from there. I don't know. Um, it's, we can kind of uh, pop to a couple of the folks who were uh, early on in regards to mentoring. Uh, Buffy, since you're sitting next to Corin, why don't you chat um, about your coming into Nonprofit Commons and uh, some of your um, work there, too? Yeah, sure, Ray. Hi, everybody. Um, so I actually read a article in Popular Science about Second Life and how you could make money and that I was curious about and uh, from there I joined and went to the Yahoo time capsule. I don't know if anybody remembers that but I met someone who had uh, TechSoup in their profile and that really uh, got me excited because uh, the nonprofit I volunteer with we use TechSoup a lot and from there I found out about the upcoming nonprofit comments because I dropped off a thank you note to uh, Glitter Actica, uh, Susan, thanking TechSoup for all they do um, for our program. And Susan replied and invited Bridges to join and then I went, uh, I was on the board at the time and trying to convince the board members who were mostly uh, older women, retired women, that joining a cartoon world uh, would be a good thing for Bridges. That was quite the meeting, but in the end, I did, and they supported me fully, and then um, built the office that we had, and I was just so excited to be part of such an amazing collection of women. I, I'm not a, uh, uh, not women, but um, people from all over the world, and I'm not a gamer either, so when I was one day realizing how much I felt for all these people that I never met that were cartoons, I knew I was hooked for life and I've never looked back. And that's um, that's how I became involved. That's great. Back to you, Ray. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and then uh, why don't we head back the kind of the other way. Um, Zinni, I know you were another early member as well, so why don't you um, kind of pick up and go next. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. So I joined um, the Nonprofit Commons in 2008 and like Buffy, you know, I had read about Second Life. Actually my dad had seen several articles about it and it was um, something that he was very interested in. Um, and we didn't have high and high speed cable where I live. I live on the Olympic Peninsula, which is, you know, um, pretty rural, as we like to say, at the end of the road. Um, <laughs> and, and so the moment, um, I got high speed, I signed up, uh, for Second Life and, uh, worked really hard to find a decent hairdo and, um, set up my avatar and, Yes, thank you. Um, the, I wanted to be sure that I arrived at a nonprofit commons meeting as myself. Um, and I had, you know, was interested in this because, like I said, you know, we're a rural area. Um, because I've worked with nonprofits for uh, 20 years, serving on boards, um, being a fundraiser. And I was in a location that I was missing, you know, those kind of connections, the partnerships, um, the sharing of ideas. And as um, we had shared with you guys, all the different conferences that I teach at, I just love to teach and share and, and encourage people. And so I was looking for um, an opportunity to do that, as well as that I wanted to get into virtual worlds so that I could continue to teach uh, at the college level 
in different locations as well. And so the Nonprofit Commons ended up being just the right community for me to jump into and um, start participating. And I think that uh, probably at my first meeting that I attended, um, Ethel Lored contacted me, who's another one of our members, and he noted that, you know, I, I work with small uh, art museums. And he worked at work for a small museum, and so he's like, "Let's team up, you know. Let's let's start working together." And that was so exciting for me to to find a partner. Like the moment I came in to be able to work with, and then I remember Buffy, who was the in charge of the mentors, invited me to a party which um, Karen and Brenda were hosting. And so you know, this inclusive nature was really really excellent. Um, to pop in and feel like I was part of something and of course um, they understood that I was the kind of person who says yes to everything <laughs> and I'm, I'm learning to say no now I'm learning to say no it's only taken me um, <laughs> what uh, eight years um, so I said yes to you know um, being able to help mentor to be able to teach people um, to start hosting a, a networking event. Um, yes, Warfrats was a, an excellent way of networking with people, and I hope we can talk a little bit more about how Warfrats and uh, Common Ground have been an important part of connecting with people, teaching people, and so forth. And um, and so that they. I'm not saying that you guys took advantage of me, but you took advantage of, you know, what I really love to do, which is to develop communities, um, encourage people, support folks, generate ideas, and within this space, you know, I was able to make really fantastic friends that I could trust and rely on. And, yeah, that's right. And, you know, what happened was that it gave me a chance to, um, share and give back um, again and again and again which really you know filled my soul when I needed it in a place that you know like I mentioned we're an isolated location and there's not a lot of people who understand the passion and the compassion that it takes to work with nonprofits so it's excellent to you know every single week to have that boost um, I guess it would be our vitamin V for volunteerism to, to cheer each other on and um, really, really be there for each other. Um, and I, I do appreciate that every week we have an opportunity to teach each other, um, share ideas, partner, and be inclusive, as well as that part of developing this community and being part of something special was it it's allowed me to sharpen my skills um, as an instructor as someone who works in virtual worlds also to be able to bring my students to our meetings and our networking parties so that they gain new skills and learn to communicate with people um, and meet people from all over the world and in turn to be able to go out there in the physical world to see all of these friends as well. There's a few of them I haven't had a chance to meet, but I'm plotting. I'm plotting. <laughs> Indeed. And, <laughs> Go on. Oh, I was just going to say, and I wanted to mention that I, I added an extra empty cushion uh, up here on the stage to remind all of you how inclusive our community is and that we're always saving a seat for you. That's great. Um, and uh, next, uh, we can hop to, to Red to talk with Marie. Um, and um, Marie, if you want to chat about your kind of coming into Nonprofit Commons and also some of, uh, you know, a bit more on the work that you do and how that relates to uh, uh, Second Life. And so. Thank you, Marie. I want to thank everyone for being here today. It's Usually, I also want to thank Buffy because I think this was Buffy's idea and it's a perfect segue in terms of how I came into Second Life. Um, I've heard of Second Life and I think I've created an account years ago and I sort of figured it was like an email where you just create an account and then you're done. And then I went to my orientation for fielding and I saw 
there were more involved beyond creating the account and you have to have an avatar and actually get into the platform. And so the first place I did see was the campus um, for fielding. And then after my orientation, I sort of went out and started exploring and I type nonprofit because this is really my world. It's higher ed, nonprofit work, and then a lot of things related to books and poetry. And so I think Buffy was really the first avatar that I ran into on the nonprofit uh, sim because I was just wandering around um, and I didn't really know anything yet so usually I'm just sort of going between um, NPC and in my campus but there wasn't much going on on the campus other than studying which I needed a break from and as you guys know when you first get in here you have nothing so, which means there's no money, there's no clothes, you don't really know where to go for certain things. And I'm telling you, she was sort of like my angel, you know, sort of virtual angel to sort of help me, guide me along the way. And after talking to her and sharing my interests to sort of say, you might be interested in this group. And I discovered the Four Bridges Project and I got involved in that. And I'm kind of similar to Zinia where I said yes to everything that I'm interested in. So I became part of the Four Bridges Project, then I discovered the literary community, which is pretty much writers and poets and musicians and all these wonderful creative types. Um, and they're all at the nonprofit comments. So that's one of the reason, you know, with my show, it's like sometimes you think you're talking to a professor or a blogger, and then you keep talking, and you realize they do so much more beyond that one title. Um, which is what I love here. And I just love the global aspect of Second Life because, you know, Buffy is so completely somewhere else. Um, I haven't really met anyone who's really in Boston, in Boston. Um, I took the opportunity to meet with um, Malay, who is the founder of the Four Bridges Project. So I went all the way to Maine because when you make those connections in Second Life, if there are opportunities to really connect and collaborate in real life, uh, we make that happen as well. So I went all the way to Bangor, Maine to meet with Malay and talk about how we want to do some collaboration with education and our work. And with the Girls Project, this year we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. So when I first started this, I was, let's just say, much younger. And I'm always looking for ways to sort of move forward in terms of what we were doing when we first started in terms of media. We were primarily focusing on TV magazines and focusing on images that girls and young women were being exposed to and also music on, on television, so music videos. And I thought this work was going to be sort of limited and then you just keep expanding and those issues seem to continue to be relevant. Um, and now you add other aspects like social media and virtual worlds and some of the same issues are still present. But my goal was really to sort of how do we use the platform and become content creators, which is really at the core of Second Life. So it's not enough to sort of be critical of mainstream media or gaming, but how do we create alternative where we make positive out of something that, you know, people use it for different things. You may create something to do good and somebody else do something completely different with it. And so as I look ahead in terms of where's the project going or other things that I'm interested in, you know, I want to take advantage of all the opportunities Second Life has to offer, but also thinking of ways different age group and different demographics can use Second Life. And so for me personally, the education has remained, the nonprofit has remained, and also really sharing the work through this um, new television program that I started, but now I'm moving more toward radio. And so now I do, um, you know, talk with Maria and Blog Talk Radio as a way to sort of really talk about these issues, bring people together, but also expose virtual world to other people who may not have heard of it. I think sometime, I assume people know about whatever I'm doing, but then you realize we sometimes teaching or preaching to the converted. And so I want other people who may not have heard about virtual world or the nonprofit world and what all these people are doing. So I don't want it to be hidden. I want to share it and expose it and bring in other people. And so there are so many opportunities to 
build our community, but also continue to expand it and bring people in. And so that's what I'm hoping I will continue to have the energy to keep doing and, you know, really make our community stronger. And one of the things I want to say is a lot of changes have happened since five years in Second Life. My university is no longer in Second Life, but the nonprofit commons has remained the most constant um, community in terms of all the work that I'm doing. So a lot of smaller groups come and go. And I think if it wasn't for the nonprofit commons, I probably wouldn't have a space to really talk about the girls' projects and women's issues. And of course, March is the perfect time to really sort of uh, remember that in terms of celebrating women internationally and then uh, within the U.S. So thank you again to the Nonprofit Commons and also to VWBPE for bringing us together and thank you to everyone for listening and sharing your stories. Thanks, Red. Um, so we also had sitting with us on the other side of Buffy, um, Cheyenne. Um, and uh, she unfortunately lost power. Um, she's on solar. So uh, she, they had some uh, hiccup there. Um, but she messaged us. So, you know, I'll share a little bit about the nonprofit that, that Cheyenne is part of um, and runs. And, um, and then uh, we can kind of chat about a, a, a community event that um, was recently held that, that uh, her org had, or, had uh, organized. So, um, uh, as I think I mentioned, that she's the director of Protect Yourself One. Um, and they promote personal responsibility and evidence-based health education about uh, HIV and sexually transmitted diseases and related conditions uh, using STEM skills, music, art, emerging technology, and media. And that also includes uh, work in virtual worlds. Uh, their educational programs, events, and activities educate youth on how to protect themselves from HIVs and STIs and decrease the number of new HIV infections by reducing risky behaviors among under underserved at-risk youth um, and uh, I know that you know she they, as she does a lot of work with youth she also does programs in uh, Second Life Open Simulator with it with youth and also in, in spaces like Minecraft um, and she uh, is a regular member at our meetings um, and has had others from within her organization uh, the, uh, come with and present as, long, as well as herself and then also uh, host uh, uh, kind of community-wide events uh, that focus around uh, AIDS awareness uh, including uh, the uh, AIDS uh, World AIDS Day uh, which falls on December 1st every year um, a World AIDS Day virtual walk um, and for that I can probably turn it over to um, Buffy and uh, probably Zinnia, but I know Buffy set up the helps her, helped her set up the walk um, to chat a little bit about that, and then we can kind of move on to some other more general questions for folks. So Buffy, if you want to jump in and chat a little bit about World's A World AIDS Day and that event that Cheyenne put on. Uh, sure, right, uh, right. Um, so what what happened was she came and said she wanted to do this virtual walk and we weren't sure how to approach it because the non-private commons is on two, two uh, sims now so that would be a long walk for everybody so we went around and, and looked at kind of a, a good route and timed it so it would take about an hour or less um, so she helped me set up stations we put um, kind of a tribute or a statistic at each station and had a little, I put flags everywhere so we knew where to go and um, on the day I, it's the first walk like that I've ever participated in and what I, what I found was how sobering it was when I came to each station and then Shay would uh, chat out some of the stats or some of the information about about AIDS in general or about the epidemic or about how it was a problem in other countries and and I just found and we all carried a, a candle too which um, you know you have to be immersed to understand how that feels that you it, it felt to me just very sobering and and I felt very connected to everybody and 
and I learned a lot through the walk uh, from that information. So, and it, it took about an hour. And what we did is we, if anybody ever wants to go there at our main meeting place, we left the flags and the information at each flag. So uh, you can take that walk for yourself. And um, I don't know, Z, if you want to add anything with that? Absolutely. Um, this walk was actually a great example of how we use a virtual space to educate folks. And, you know, as Buffy mentioned, you know, it was sobering to gather with a group of people to learn more about how AIDS and HIV are impacting our entire world and also to know that we have members in our community that are affected by it and for us to be able to walk together um, carrying candles and going through uh, our space, our sims together and you know having uh, have an opportunity to share this knowledge with us so that we can spread it to others and also because um, this environment can maintain and uh, this information we can continue to share it with folks um, it is a way for people to get together also to build things and finding that we have so many partnerships between our community members doing events like this um, you know not only are they a good cause but they're a good opportunity for us to recognize that we're all in this together and I think it was a very special event and I know that um, we captured also video for it and I think that's available on YouTube so if you don't have an opportunity to walk the walk definitely watch the video and see the impact that we're talking about that's great yep and and since I've got the both of you talking to um, uh, I'm sort of changing up kind of what we we're going to chat about uh, uh, a bit next um, though I think it still falls into place you know our that nonprofit Commons mission it really focuses around lowering that barrier of access to second life and creating that community of practice as, a, as we've been talking about and to sort of help learn and um, explore these spaces and I think an important part of that has also been um, you know outside of things like all of us coming together on our weekly meetings and folks sharing their work and having office space you know I think another important piece of that have been um, that we have a, a mentor group and and that this peer mentoring becomes an essential kind of um, you know kind of hand-holding and peer-to-peer -peer way to uh, uh, learn the space quickly and also there for resources and questions and anything that's needed so um, it would be great um, you know I know um, uh, Zinnia is the lead of our uh, kind of our mentors though you know and Buffy is part of it and obviously I know Red sometimes fills in and corn as he's mentioned as well but uh, 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 Buffy it'd be great to kind of start chatting about that to tell people about that common ground and some of the other related stuff um, and then we can kind of maybe jump to Buffy and, and Corin. Uh, right. Did you mean start with Xenia? Yes. Me? Oh, sorry. With Xenia. <laughs> okay. So you go Z. <laughs> Are we going in, in opposite alphabetical order? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, you finished speaking. You had just finished speaking, so I figured it'd be good to seg to you. Yeah. Back to you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, so you're right. Um, we do have a number of community events um, besides our our weekly meetings on Friday morning. Um, you know, starting off with uh, Wharf Rats, which was on Tuesday evenings, um, and Corin and Brenna hosted that. And, you know, having a, another event that people can participate was an opportunity for people to mix and mingle, make friends, and so forth. And then we um, added Common Ground, which gave me an opportunity to um, use my skills as a event uh, coordinator and uh, decorator of course um, to every week you know come up with a different theme which gave people an opportunity to again gain new skills um, learn to build make new outfits um, go shopping which we all know gives us skills but at the same time you know building these this event um, doing war frats and also fundraising events really does um, 
bring people together. I, I believe in developing community events in order to uh, facilitate community all the more. And what I found was that in doing this, it also gave us opportunities to do things in the physical world. Um, for example, at uh, the Second Life Community Conference in 2009, that was when I got to meet a number of our, our members. And um, Corin and Ethelred and I did a panel about how, you know, doing community events actually builds community. It actually creates inclusion. It not only makes awareness, but it gives us a chance to, to teach people how to use the space. And, um, and in doing that, fostering those connections, uh, fostering partnerships, we recognized that actually new orgs could be formed in this process. Um, Ethel Red and I developed a new uh, nonprofit, which is the Museum Collective Inc. And there's also another team that was built. And I think Buffett, you're part of of that team. Was it Floaters that came together in, in Second Life? Uh, yes, there were uh, five of us that um, joined together for a project called Transition C. Excellent. And, you know, other teams have been formed in opportunities like this conference to be able to come together and present together. I know um, that Brenna and I have worked together. Um, you know, it's really nice to have a, a friend who can review your work and see what you're doing, but also to present. And at the, the Second Life Community Conference um, in 2011, uh, Brenna had an opportunity to come and participate and a chance to, you know, share what she's doing um, in virtual worlds, which was unique and new to so many people. And then for her to be able to be in world um, also to share her experiences and professionalism. I mean, that's what these community events allow. Um, and when it comes to turning it around into mentorship, it's any of us can become a mentor. Any of us have great wisdom to share. And I think that it's important for us to recognize that in each other and encourage that in each other. Um, and I, I know for myself that I've learned a lot and I've learned way more and have higher expectations than any volunteer <laughs> that I work with now, thanks to this team. Um, I'm going to throw it back to you, Buffy, and the fact that, um, you know, we were joking around that you're our fairy godmother, but you have been such a welcoming role. And I think maybe you could share a little bit about how important it is to reach out to others in community events. Uh, sure, Z, and, and thank you. Um, I think what happens is that I'm so passionate about this platform and about how the nonprofit Commons has stayed true to its mission is it comes out when I meet people because I I want them to participate and to join in and to be part of this great community. Um, as far as uh, being a mentor, I think I just I've always been a mentor all my life uh, in my office job and as a consultant. Um, it, it just I fell into that role naturally, and and it was lucky when we first came because my mentor was actually Corin, who was who's here. He he helped me out, and together uh, there used to be a group of us that hung around because we were. I don't know, we just didn't have enough to do or something in real life, but we used to hang around and we fell into that role naturally of helping people when they dropped in. And then the nonprofit Commons uh, Second Life had a program going called the Community Gateway, and we were one of those gateways, the nonprofit Commons. And so we, uh, people that were signing up would be given the option where to land and they could choose the nonprofit Commons. So we manned that station and quite regularly and, and helped people and uh, that fell through but we realized the great need for mentorship and how much 
you know, it's very difficult, as we all know. We've all been here for the first time to understand how to use the client and uh, all the options, and it's it's but daunting for people that aren't gamers. And um, so we decided to have a formal official mentor group at the non-private commons, and I think that's been a contributing factor to um, having people come but um, having them stay uh, to get over those barriers of learning how to walk and sit and not, I mean, even though we're avatars, I, I know uh, some of us, or I have, if I bump into somebody or I, I didn't know how to sit and sat on somebody's head, I mean, it feels a bit embarrassing or silly. So um, I think that's really, again, been a contributing factor that we have this formal uh, mentor team that meet after our Friday morning team. And we uh, also do some of the events that we have, so the dances, and Z talked about the ones that we have weekly, but um, special occasions like our our annual uh, party for our anniversary of Nonprofit Commons and other special fundraising events. So, um, yeah, I think that's all I need to say about that. So, uh, back to you, Rai. mentoring that happens during uh, those spaces too I think you know that 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 concept of, of um, you know peer learning and helping also kind of permeates through everything and 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 beyond just the say ramping folks up to uh, second life skills you know we a lot of what we're focusing in on too is is tackling the challenges of you know technology for nonprofits in general you know and uh, so once folks get their feet comfortable and are in this space, you know, they're also then learning about how to, um, you know, uh, learning about interacting and, um, and exploring and, and uh, how to uh, do other technologies, whether that be, you know, social media or um, uh, digital media, storytelling, or uh, other topics that are kind of much more, you know, future uh, innovative tech, like, you know, learning about the Internet of Things or big data and on how those impact uh, uh, nonprofits and the work that they do. Uh, so, you know, uh, we can kind of uh, jump from there a bit. Um, you know, so we were, we were chatting about, you know, obviously environments like uh, Second Life, and uh, and and why are they valuable for for nonprofits and educators and others? Like, what are some of the more powerful use case stories that that you can think of, uh, whether that be from your own work or um, you know from the uh, your mentoring or other things here within in Second Life, and uh, why don't we jump that back over to uh, Brenna and uh, have her uh, chat on that? Thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> I can think of a few different examples in my time and in involvement with uh, the nonprofit Commons over the years and in my work directly. Um, as Zenia was talking about fundraising efforts. Uh, a few moments ago, one of the projects that I became involved in uh, was the virtual Haiti uh, hub and raising funds uh, to help Haiti uh, recover after the catastrophic damage. And I really felt compelled to um, do what I could, uh, but I knew that, you know, going and being on the ground and, and things like that firsthand was not something that I was uh, prepared or in a position to do. And so collectively, uh, we were able to come together uh, with uh, people from all over the world uh, to raise uh, donations uh, to help the uh, people of Haiti uh, work to recover and build, rebuild. And, um, you know, as we talked here within the Nonprofit Commons about what we could do uh, to uh, 
aid this process, uh, we were able to come up with several different events that we held throughout uh, the course of a um, few week period of time, uh, all the way from you know educational meetings uh, to actual fundraising efforts. And um, at that point, uh, I had the idea to coordinate uh, a formal ball, uh, if you will, kind of a red carpet event within the the uh, virtual environment to help raise funds. And um, I really felt the sense of community when um, fellow members of, of NPC uh, got behind me and uh, really um, collectively we came together, we made it happen, um, you know, and it was really great to feel that sense of community. Uh, and, and support and that we were all united uh, from all over the world for a global cause. So that's just one event right here within the nonprofit community uh, that I've been able to participate in um, with my work directly. Um, I've been able to serve in, in the capacity of, of providing substance abuse and mental health services for um, over 20 years. Um, from the front line all the way up to doing clinical intervention uh, via counseling and family counseling over the years. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work with people struggling to uh, even get clean for a day uh, to people that uh, we've been able to, um, by pri providing services, uh, have been able to sustain some recovery uh, for many people. Um, you know, more recovery time than they've been able to maintain in the past. Um, I think the greatest compliment that I have ever been given in my entire professional career was a parent uh, of a child that I served in our virtual platform. Upon completion of their program, their parent made the comment that they felt like they had their child back before their drug use. And I was really taken aback. Um, to me, um, that was the greatest compliment that I could be given as a clinician um, because that really validated that this means of treatment worked for that individual and it worked better than any hope uh, or, or outcome that we as a program could strive for. That's great, Brenna, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the transition things. That really was such a kind of grassroots from within the community at large that rose up to, to help support uh, uh, with that. Uh, in a way, I think that's very special to this um, virtual environment, um, you know, and, and a lot of us a lot of us um, might know of the use case of Relay for Life, for example. Um, you know that I mean, there's a lot of us within this community that take part of it, though it is not organized by nonprofit Commons, of course. Um, you know, and they've raised hundreds of thousands of U.S. dollars every year um, for for you know as uh, and is actually one of the American Cancer Society considers the collective efforts here in Second Life one of their you know top 10 largest teams around the world um, you know they consider it all as one large team in a way but you know of, of fundraising so you can think of it that way and and I put the number in chat just a bit ago but virtual Haiti relief in maybe less than two months I, it wasn't a very long campaign per se um, raised what was 10,000 US dollars about in um, you know in microtransactions from all the events and sales and you know donations that took place in, in, in uh, Second Life in the virtual environment like this so I think it's definitely a powerful example um, you know I don't know if uh, we were talking about kind of you know use case stories too I don't know if uh, uh, um, Red if you have anything that you wanted to share um, kind of jump to you if you want about how um, you might be using the space or th uh, are there, uh, or others in regards to uh, Second Life. Uh, sure. I mean, I think for me it's really sort of a reciprocity sort of process where bringing people into Second Life but also letting people know Second Life exists. Um, in January we had our first Media Literacy Week 
I believe, in the U.S. And there were events taking place all over the place. And a lot of time when I go to networking events, people, I'm probably the only person talking about Second Life. So a lot of time I feel like I'm talking about going to the moon or something that's really sort of advanced that no one ever um, heard of. And so for me, it's really sort of, talking about second life and a way the way we talk about social media and email and how do we incorporate it in education or speaking with educators or people from different industries because it's not just one it doesn't fit just you know people teaching technology and i think my role is sort of becoming more about um defying some of the stereotypes or misperception people have about virtual worlds and so and how can it be used because i can't even imagine you know when buff was talking about talking to the board and how is this relevant and when you think of nonprofit or even the educational setting when people are struggling for resources and then you bring this idea and you're like how about this one and so for me you know the positive has been sort of people just hearing about just what we're doing now how people are using it and then being part of it by just uh, participating. And so I do a conference every year at Simmons College in Boston, which is in the Fenway area. And having someone come and present about how they're using Second Life and having the audience be either younger or never use it and being able to sort of um, see how do they fit into that role and how they can sort of apply whatever they're learning in the classroom and their communities, that it's not like a foreign concept. Um, and so right now it's really thinking about like how to break those challenges in real life, the way nonprofit commons has done for groups to come into second life, you know, technology is still an issue where it's not accessible to all. And so thinking of ways to really make it, um, to think about all the means that someone may need to sort of be introduced to it. Um, and I think for me, that's the bigger one. Even my own school, it's still the same. I'm still the only person that's building some time, still talking about Second Life. And it's always like a weird thing where you sort of like, you feel like a complete, like a weirdo because people are like, why is that relevant to education? And so, again, I think going back to um, NPC and VWBE in terms of those doing that type of work and gathering is really important. But at the same time, just spreading the message out there that this is how people are using it in all environment from all walks of life and from all over the world. And that's the part I love to tell people in terms of how it brings us together. It's not about just fun and games that people make real um, changes and you learn new things and, and how do we incorporate that in whatever's going on elsewhere without people feeling overwhelmed like one more thing we have to do whether it's in a non-profit setting or um within and within the university or even just a regular classroom uh, for example so i mean i think for me the impact has been more personally but again how do i bring that to my members for the girls project regardless of the age group regardless of language ethnicity class and access to technology Thanks, Red. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I've certainly um, experienced some of that too. As I mentioned a bit when I was uh, chatting about my own background, for many years I worked with uh, New York City educational nonprofit Global Kids, and there was a lot of focus on this. You know, how do you, how do you kind of empower youth through digital media and learning and and environments like virtual worlds, and and you know, and kind of bringing that civic responsibility angle and and um, make them better global citizens by using this as another, um, uh, you know, kind of tool in their in their bucket of how to be able to kind of uh, you know ex express their their kind of their messages and and learn about and and uh, collaborate and. Um, with uh, folks from around the world um, and I'll throw a link in for um, there's still many many years of back uh, knowledge with it uh, that we kind of dealt with in the global kids related stuff and I'll throw a link in for that um, I know that that Zinnia called you out for this Buffy but I, I you know I think um, you know if we want to chat about other kind of interesting 
use cases and things that have evolved in, in Second Life, the whole um, uh, transitions uh, project that uh, I know that I had helped you on and others from within Nonprofit Commons were also part of. If you want to chat about that, Buffy, that would be great. Uh, sure. So um, it was called Transitions, a place for dreams. And uh, at one of the meetings, I think it was in Kenzo, uh, was talking about gathering a group to talk about homelessness. So I stayed back, and uh, out of that, we she was uh, and Kenzo was talking about oh, we're going to do things like mashups, and and I thought that was for potatoes. I had I had no idea what a mashup was at that time. And what she was talking about was uh, gathering um, information from all over the internet and having it sorted out. Uh, somehow she was going to figure out how to um, call it all and information that would be of interest to people in transition or homelessness. And it was a very exciting project. We had five of us from, uh, there was myself from Canada, somebody from Boston, Arizona, LA, and Seattle. And I know uh, Ozma from Floaters was a very big part of that and was bringing um, her idea of helping students at the uh, Arizona State University and to help them with skills training. And um, so we met often and did a lot of work trying to get grants to get this mashup uh, database together and unfortunately we weren't successful in that. I think it was just ahead of its time because they're, you know, now they have apps that um, are on your mobile that can do that and, um, but I think the whole idea of us coming together on a specific project uh, and working towards that really made us um, more connected and more understanding of e each other's causes and and likes and things that we wanted to do uh, singly. Now we could do together. And um, I was really disappointed that we couldn't get the funding because I again I think it was ahead of its time and we would have the the um, end result would be we would have this website where if somebody who was either homeless and homeless mean doesn't mean you're a street person if your house burns down or there's an earthquake or some natural disaster and suddenly you're on the street it was the idea of where do you find all these services that you need um, handily and uh, like I said I think it was it was just uh, ahead of its time and um, but but the lesson was learned that we can collaborate in these kind of spaces and it doesn't matter where we are um, when we have a, a common idea that we want to bring to fruition. It's just, um, it's a one, I mean, getting back to this whole idea of the virtual world and, and nonprofits and how we can collaborate, that was a, a really good example and it would have worked had we got the funding because we certainly had the, the spirit and the knowledge behind to, to pull it off. So uh, back to you, right? I think that pretty well sums it up. Yeah, and I, I put the, um, the link into, uh, for the project in, uh, in the chat. I think for some reason, you could tell, so, um, you know, myself uh, and uh, at, the, at the time, uh, Julius Lioncourt, who's Joshua Stortz in real life, we were kind of like the tech help for this. And this predates me being any... You know, I was, I was at that point just more of a socially conscious, you know, uh, person that was also using Second Life that would get involved in these projects. But I actually, at that point, was not, uh, you know, a nonprofit men men mentor or, or member, or you know, certainly not the uh, community organizer. So I, you know, I think that shows you the power that there's evolution of folks kind of coming in who then get stickier in deeper ways, as I certainly was. Um, and in fact, I, you know, I still host this site. Uh, Buffy to the the transitions of place for dreams, um, so and and on the right it lists those uh, the folks that had collaborated on it. If you do check out the site, and you know I, I think as as Buffy was saying, you know it definitely it was an example of I think of folk of of a community coming together and like you know akin to what Brenna was saying, like we have this problem, how do we brainstorm it, how do we work on it, and 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 how do we maybe solve this together, um, regardless of where the geography of folks are or, or any of that. Um, uh, 
Yes, yes, yep. And uh, um, Mary Lou is mentioning the floater site uh, in Nonprofit Commons is still doing some of that work in real life. And uh, that's that's true. And um, and even I think um, the information in regards to um, uh, I don't think I don't know if Ozma's I don't think Ozma's here today, but Ozma still continues to do um, Ozma Malibu, who Sandra Adams, who uh, Sandra Sandra Andrews, sorry, who at the time um, was the uh, sort of the director of Alt I, which was out of Arizona State University, and their sort of innovative technology and and how they were using it for education, but also was very she herself was also very rooted in in kind of um, uh, you know social good and and uh, and um, issues of uh, the homeless and migrant populations and indigenous peoples and so she was another kind of force behind this so shout out to Ozma wherever you are um, and um, oh that's great Mary Lou that she was your former student that's amazing um, that shows the connections in that way so uh, I don't know if um, if Zinnia you want to kind of jump in on any uh, examples that or thoughts that you might have on kind of some of the interesting use cases that or stories that have risen up through uh, some of the work that we're doing um, either in this virtual environment so thank you you know there are so many wonderful stories that we have um, participated in over the years one of the things I was thinking about as we were talking is that quite often people will ask me well why would I want to participate in virtual worlds um, and I, I know so many people say, I already have enough friends. And, <laughs> and that always surprises me that, um, that they have a limit, you know. And, and what I find is that the people who we work in this space are limitless. Um, they're so generous with their, their time and their talent, and we learn so much from each other. Um, also, people will ask, well, why would I need a virtual office? And there are nonprofits that don't have actual physical offices. And so to be able to have a space, some sort of ownership, actually strengthens the commitment of that organization. And it gives us a chance to share with folks that you can come and visit our virtual office. It's a real office. It's a real space where ideas, um, are shared, where partnerships are built, and a place for us to be able to share our different miss missions. And um, I know for lots of different conferences and meetings and such that I share images of, of the offices that I've built uh, at the Nonprofit Commons, and people are like, where is that? I, I want to go there. You know, and they're looking for an actual address, and they're so excited that that could be a space that they could participate in. And they are delighted to find out that they can visit and they can stay in their pajamas as they're visiting us. Also, there are nonprofits that utilize our space as a place to define what is possible in the physical world. Again, they may not have the, the actual spot, um, but they can build it in Second Life, and they can inspire people through that build. It's very important. When I think about uh, different events that have happened and fundraisers and things like that, one um, I might mention is an event that was done for a preferred family health care which was the Art House. And that was organized by a number of artists in Second Life who wanted to help contribute to a real uh, organization that helps support the arts and children. And, you know, I was really amazed how generous these artists were. Yes, and I don't know, you know, I know I took a lot of pictures, I know I, I participated, um, but um, you guys might have to share a little bit more about it, but I want to tell you as a participant, um, you know, I I felt like I was able to contribute to an organization that, you know, was miles and miles away and that, you know, I felt like I was there, I was part of something special. And then I got to work with all these other artists who contributed as well. and. For me to be able to share what happened at this event 
with my organization, my local organizations, it inspired them to do similar events. And right now I'm participating in an event um, for Habitat for Humanity where we have artists who uh, painted different doors and those doors will be auctioned off as a fundraising event. Um, and when people are able to see things that are similar in a virtual space, they want to create them in a physical space. Maybe you guys can share a little bit about that event, the Art House, and what happened there. Well, this kind of came from a friendship that I uh, started with uh, with Jeffrey Lipsky, or AKA Filthy Fluno, here in Second Life, and. Um, I had met him in world, and then, as is the case with with many people, um, I had the opportunity to meet him in person at one of the uh, Second Life uh, conventions down in uh, Tampa uh, several years ago, and uh, then we we uh, connected again. I was he li he lived in Boston, and uh, I was in Boston for a conference, and I. Uh, sent him an email and told him I was going to be in town. So we got together and we went out to dinner and, and uh, you know spent the evening chatting about our various experiences, both inside and outside of Second Life. And and I you know I was telling him about some of the things that that we were doing at Preferred Family Healthcare. He, he had been doing these kind of art events at the Second Life community conventions and. Um, he said, why, well, why don't we do something like that for preferred and we'll, uh, we'll turn it into a fundraiser and we'll create art in real life and we'll create art in second life and we'll auction it off. And, um, so I talked to Brenda about it and then we, we had to talk to preferred family healthcare about it because they had to, uh, underwrite some, some real life meetings that we had, but it, uh, it, you know, it turned out extremely well, and and uh, uh, Jeff and CJ, his friend, and some other people got involved in it, and uh, you know, it, it it turned into just a great uh, uh, bringing together of people with skills and talents, abilities, and a willingness to be of help with organizations that that could use the help. And uh, I don't I don't remember how much money we actually raised, uh, Brenda, but it was a meaningful amount of money. Uh, yes, we actually um, did raise quite a bit, um, not just at the Second Life conventions um, from sharing the art, but the actual uh, in-world donations that filtered out. And uh, it was really great to uh, have the community collectively come together. We had a uh, kind of a, a final party and uh, everything, and there were some st substantial donations uh, that came uh, through the contributions of the artist and the community at large, uh, both in, in the Second Life community and in, in the real life community. And it was um, really enlightening to see um, artists uh, supporting the, the work that we're trying to do using art uh, mediums to try to help um, individuals recover from their substance abuse and create healthy outlets and hobbies. Uh, so we, we can't thank that community enough for what they've done for us over the years. Thanks. These are, these are all open. Well, I, th I think what, what, what this illustrates too is something that, that I'm thinking about is uh, in terms of, of the value of community inside Second Life is uh, even beyond uh, you know, events or use cases. It's just the wide variety of people that you're able to meet that you probably wouldn't have met anywhere else. And uh, the, you know, active members of the community have always demonstrated to me their interest and willingness to, uh, to be helpful in one way or another. And, uh, you know, I could just tick off really dozens of connections that I've made inside of, of Second Life, both as part of nonprofit commons as, 
as well as just kind of, uh, you know, be meeting interesting people by wandering around, that type of thing. And, uh, and these things are, you know, they're invaluable friendships and some of them have turned into working and in business relationships. And, and, um, I, I think the expansion of your world that's becomes available to you by participating, uh, on, uh, a platform like Second Life or an open sim or any of these uh, virtual environments is is remarkable. That's great. Um, certainly, I think a lot of examples here of that. So we have probably about a little less than twenty minutes to to we wrap. But um, you know, kind of as a probably final quick thoughts on some things that. You know, what do you think the, and this I'll kind of call you out on this, but what do you think the future holds for nonprofits and others use, using virtual worlds and, and other, you know, technologies, uh, whether that be virtual reality or augmented reality, or we're seeing a lot of other kind of future related stuff. Um, and, you know, in, especially in anything that you might be exploring that you think is interesting um, and could impact uh, social change or the mission of your org. Um, why don't we go back to, um, to, to Red for now and then... Uh, uh, your thoughts on kind of what do you think is interesting coming in the future? Uh, I mean, I think it's really sort of thinking about how do we share the work and share it sort of by letting other people know. I mean, I think one of the work that's done every year is the story core. I don't know if I'm getting it correctly, but in terms of how, and I don't know if it's because I'm a media person that I'm always thinking about, how do we sort of um, share what we're doing in a way that people from the outside world will find appealing and they may see how they can also sort of adapt the work um, that they're also doing. So I think, you know, we have to sort of be a little more strategic in terms of really looking and see um, continue to look at what are the barriers and who's missing because I think a lot of time because we are here and we try to be inclusive and we are inclusive and and our group is representative but still thinking about who's not at the table that who should be benefiting from this or who could benefit from it but they're not aware that this resource exists and how do we um, how do we share it um, and continue to be collaborative by making sure that more people are getting um, access to it. But also thinking of, you know, the more corporate aspect in terms of is, um, you know, the people who are the decision makers in terms of the platform, are they thinking about those issues? I think in a way sometimes I see um, Second Life as like a political system. Like the people, are they really sort of the one truly um, – directing what should be happening. So so really making sure that everybody's at the table of decision makers and who else should be. In. And I think Buffy, you know, for me, I feel like a lot of us, all the mentors, we do that really well in our space. The other issue might be, as we're talking about best practices, is in what other ways can we continue teaching those um, strategies to other um, to other groups, for example, because I think there are certain things that we do, other groups might be doing, and how do we continue learning um, from each other? That's great. And uh, the annual digital storytelling uh, uh, competition that, that Red brought up is called Storymakers. Um, and uh, I put a couple links into the chat. Um, in fact, actually, so it's an annual competition that TechSoup runs globally around the world. And uh, it calls out to nonprofits and, and uh, libraries and other kind of social good focused related entities to be able to submit sort of the stories of their work and uh, in short form digital stories. And that also can take the short form of machinima, which is, you know, uh, something that's very, you know, kind of gives us a leg up and an interesting digital media creation tool here. Um, and I know Sh Cheyenne isn't here, but she does a lot of that work within her work uh, as well. So um, uh, those links can kind of give you more. And, and in fact, this year, I mean, if you're interested, it will be obviously running. Um, we'll be running it through Nonprofit Commons and talking about it more at upcoming meetings. But uh, this year, they're even doing matching where they're going to um, pair up nonprofits or libraries with story, with uh, those that can help, you know, edit and 
do video or, or kind of help uh, with the writing and those things. So actually uh, pair them up with experts too. So even if you're out um, in the audience and you don't have those media skills, um, you know, you, you could still take advantage of the conference, uh, the contest and, and that in that way. So um, let's jump then for thoughts on, on the uh, future from you, Brenna. We can kind of go off on that end, on that side of things. So what do you think the future holds? I think one of the things that nonprofits as a whole are facing, and, and I think we've seen this over the last several years, is concerns about budget and funding and accessibility to services or information that nonprofits offer. And I know that part of uh, the drive of our agency uh, as far as providing virtual counseling services is making treatment accessible to people that may not otherwise have that access or have access to the intensity that they need. Um, and so uh, we continue to push forward and continue uh, working with our our grant sources uh, to hopefully be able to validate this as a uh, means of treatment that uh, not only state uh, insurance systems will recognize, uh, but also private insurance uh, entities would also recognize so that, um, you know, in the end we're providing uh, the individuals uh, the resources that they need in order to help better themselves. Um, you know, if we look at any degree of research, uh, if we don't treat the addictive behavior, that only uh, continues to multiply our social problems. Um, and in the end, uh, that trickles back down to many nonprofits. And so I think for uh, the foreseeable future, I think there will continue to be a push to be able to provide um, treatment information services uh, through uh, virtual platforms, social media, uh, so that it's more accessible. That's great. Um, uh, Corin, do you want to jump from that, uh, since we're talking about, um, you know, using it for um, related issues that I know you work with as well? Well, when I uh, think about the future, I guess <clears throat> a couple of things I think are, is important. One is uh, for us to be um, uh, good evangelists about this. Uh, it's important that we recognize that there's a lot of buzz, uh, well, you know, well placed buzz about virtual reality and, um, you know, augmented reality and goggles and things like that. And it's probably important to uh, stay schooled on that so that uh, you understand the difference between uh, a virtual environment or platform like Second Life and virtual reality, which are are related but quite different things. Uh, you're going to be potentially involved in a lot of conversations where you might be talking about uh, the Second Life experience and refer to it as virtual reality, and the person who's talking to you is going to be thinking about something entirely different. So I think it's helpful if you, if you want to... Uh, uh, sort of advance the cause of, of what we're doing here that you're you're able to describe the difference um, the other thing that I think is important in looking forward as well is uh, becoming familiar with uh, the open sim uh, uh, um, environments that are out there now and the, the bigger metaverse beyond second life uh, uh, and partly because and and this is no news, I think, to anybody who's been around for a while. We're just never really sure what Linden Lab's going to do uh, <laughs> next week. And, uh, you know, so the, the Open Sim project, which is, is a, it's more of a, you know, collaborative, uh, grassroots type of, uh, way to build virtual worlds. It's, uh, probably in many ways has more, potential stability and longevity than, than even Second Life. So if I were to be looking into my looking glasses, those are the two things I'd, I'd suggest people be paying attention to. Mm 